Good, af good afternoon. I am Dr. Sean Byrne, director of the Arthur V. Morrow Center for Peace and Justice at St. Paul's College here at the University of Manitoba. I would like to acknowledge that we are in Treaty 1 territory and on the traditional territory of the Ashina Abe peoples and the homeland of the Metis Nation. The university, the forks of the city of Winnipeg, sit at the crossroads of the Anishinaabe, Metis, Cree, Dakota, and Oji Cree nations. It is a great honor and pleasure to welcome all of you today to the 11th Sol Caney Lecture on Peace and Justice, featuring Justice Murray Sinclair. <clears throat> this lecture is presented by the Morrow Center. The Morrow Center is dedicated to research, education, and practice in the areas of conflict analysis and resolution, human rights, peace, and social justice. The Morrow Center is home to the university's doctoral program in peace and conflict studies offered through the Faculty of Graduate Studies. The PhD program is the first doctoral program of its kind in Canada and only one of a few in the world. The program has grown to four faculty members in addition to myself, Dr. Maureen Flaherty, Dr. Jessica Senehy, and Dr. Hamdasa Tuso. In addition, more than 24 adjunct faculty serve on student doctoral and master's committees in peace and conflict studies from the University of Manitoba across faculties, as well as from Menno Simons College, the University of Winnipeg, and Canadian Mennonite University. 37 students from 20 different countries are enrolled in the PhD program, many of whom hold college, university, national, and international scholarships. There are now 14 alumni of the program. 10 of our alumni hold academic positions locally and around the world. A joint master's program at the University of Winnipeg admitted its first students in the fall of 2010. There are now 39 students in the program, with five alumni having graduated. Peace and Conflict Studies graduate students have come from around the corner and around the world in a quest to create human rights, social justice, and peace in our world. And they have been supported in those efforts by the generosity of our founding donor and subsequent donors who have enabled the Morrow Center to award more than $750,000 in scholarships since 2006. This lecture series was established by the Morrow Center to honor Mr. Sol Caney, an officer of the Order of Canada who was a prominent citizen in our community. His biography is in the lecture program. It was the vision of Dr. Arthur Morrow and of the Morrow Center's founding board of directors to hear from global leaders of different faiths and backgrounds who are working for a world characterized by justice and sustainable peace. The previous Sol Kenny speakers are Prince El Hassan Ben Talal of the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan, the Honorable Lloyd Axworthy, Rabbi Michael Melchior, Cardinal Theodore McCarrick, PhD, Distinguished Professor and Haudenosaunee Chief, Orrin Lines, the Honorable Flora MacDonald, Dr. Isildine Abouilesh, Dr. Pumlo Gobodo Medigazela, Dr. Martin Manzer, and Ms. Anarada Korala. Many thanks to James Richardson and Sons Limited and the Richardson Foundation for sponsorship of the Sol Caney Lecture Series. A program is provided with the format of today's lecture. I would now like to call upon Dr. Christopher Adams, rector, who will bring greetings on behalf of St. Paul's College. Good afternoon. My name is Christopher Adams, and I'm the rector of St. Paul's College. I'm also the chairperson of the Morrow Center Board of Directors, and we're very proud of the college's work in the field of, of peace and justice. We're proud of people like Dr. Sean Byrne, Dr. Jessica Senehai, Dr. Hamdessa Tuso, and Dr. Maureen Flaherty, of other people who are contributing to our understandings of peace and justice. 
This past two weeks has been a, a, a wonderful time for Winnipeg as we work to promote uh, issues dealing with human rights. We've just seen our Canadian Museum for Human Rights opened over the past uh, two weeks. We've seen the University of Manitoba, our, our uh, fellow institution here, we've seen the University of Manitoba commit itself to launching a Master of Human Rights at the university here. We see 30 PhD students studying PhD program in Peace and Conflict Studies, 30 additional students in the joint program with the University of Winnipeg. We're doing a lot right now, we could be doing a whole lot more, but it's a, it's a week that's a, a milestone week this past little while uh, for Winnipeg and its work in human rights. We're extremely honored to have Justice Murray Sinclair here. About uh, close to a year ago, we had lunch at Nietzsche's on Main Street, and, and he was very open to, to joining us and being our, our 14th lecturer of the Sol Caney lecture. And so we, uh, we, we thought, uh, Dr. Sean Byrne and I were wondering what sort of facility should we book for this event? And we thought, well, sh should we do a bigger one? And this is a bigger facility, and we were very lucky that that, that was the decision because we would have been uh, um, overflowing if we had done any other facility on this campus. So I want to now welcome Dr. Nagan Sinclair of the Department of Native Studies here at the University of Manitoba, who will introduce our guest, the Honorable Justice Murray Sinclair. Thank you very much. Uh, I was reminded that uh, as I was coming up that I'm not in the will yet, so I have to be careful with what I say. So, so bonjour and dirwe magadaduk ni ni wichuaganuk ni gan we wedam ni dijna kas namagoshin do dem ni men wendam omayayan. It's a pleasure to be here in St. Peter's and Donchi. I, I come from a place, uh, a beautiful place just up the river, uh, St. Peter's Indian Settlement, where uh, I spent most of my life in uh, also Selkirk, Manitoba. And uh, I'm here today to introduce um, someone who uh, I've known for a little while. And uh, I'm here today to talk about, when they asked me to come and, you know, in, it's very weird to introduce your father. Uh, it's, it's, like, uh, it's like the dr opportunity you've dreamed of but also a very daunting one because uh, when, I, uh, when I was invited to do that, I thought, well, what should I, what should I speak about? Um, there's, uh, there's lots of things I could introduce about my father. And uh, there's, most of you probably know him in his professional contexts, in the way in which you see him uh, in this format, in this place, and uh, as the, uh, the chair of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, or perhaps the head of two provincial inquiries, the, uh, the Aboriginal Justice Inquiry or the Kedia, uh, K uh, Cardiac Inquest at the Health Science Center. Um, or you might know him through his law practice, or you might know him through the uh, hundreds and hundreds of volunteer hours that he gives at different organizations throughout the city, or his various Facebook posts about the weather. I don't know why he's obsessed about the weather, but if you're a Facebook friend with him, you know what I mean. Um, I could talk about all of those things, but I think what I wanted to do is I wanted to tell you about three memories that I have about my father growing up uh, and why it is so appropriate to give uh, him this position here at speaking at this wonderful lecture on peace and justice. Um, my father's was an, he's an incredible storyteller, and growing up, it's, a, it's been both an incredible gift, uh, but it's also been one of, uh, of great formative experiences for me to watch an incredible storyteller at work. Uh, he used to read me stories every night, and when he didn't have books to read, he would tell me stories. And my father is an incredible storyteller who can put jokes and laughter into absolutely anything. And one night, I remember saying to him, uh, Dad, you know, why are your stories so funny? Why are they, why do you care? Why do you want, why do you want them to be, always be so funny? And he said to me, which I've never forgotten, the, the greatest gift that you can give to another human being is to make them laugh. And my father, that has always stuck with me. I can remember that at, uh, late night at, when I was five, 
years old after hearing a story and he told me that and I've never forgotten that gift of laughter and the gift of, of beauty, of enjoyment. And that's the first story. The second story that I, uh, I, I remember about my father, one of the very first and earliest memories I have of my father is uh, we, were, we were going to an event to uh, something that he was being honored for, something that I don't even remember what the event was about, but we were late as usual. And uh, we were rushing to this community hall in, in Winnipeg, and it was one of those minus 50 degree days. And uh, it was very cold, extremely icy. And uh, I remember we were driving along, we were just rushing like crazy, and um, we were driving up just, I think it was Salter. And uh, my father just suddenly stopped the car, immediately pulled over, and got out of the car, leaving my, sis my two sisters and myself in the vehicle. And I remember peeking my head out and seeing my dad helping a, an old man. Uh, I don't really even know what that old man looked like, but that an old man lift himself up who had fallen down on the ice in the middle of the road and had stopped to help this man up and then took him into his house and was gone for a few minutes. I, I, I hope he locked the door now that I'm thinking about it now, but, um, but he, uh, uh, he went into, his, into this house and took care of this man and I'll never forget that moment because I can't ever uh, remember a more formative moment in my life of seeing my father in, her, in a hurry to get there to help this man. Uh, that has been both two models for my life. The first is around laughter and around storytelling. And the second is, is around being gracious and being respectful and also remembering how important it is to help people how to work with people and to ultimately help people who uh, perhaps have fallen down on the streets and it can help them into a house. Um, the third memory that I have of my father is being grounded. Now, if you've been grounded by a father, that's hard enough, but try having being grounded by a father that's a judge. It's a whole new layer because when you're late or when you do something wrong, um, he not only gets to be the judge, but he's also the primary witness. So he calls himself to the stand, and then he doesn't really have a gavel, he has a crooked finger, and you'll probably see it today, because he pulls out this crooked finger, it's like this. And then finally, the executioner, he gets to decide that the capital punishment will be revisited in this country. And, and so, uh, being grounded by my father is an uh, uh, incredible moment, but it's also one of justice because he makes you explain everything and why you did it. Uh, and so that's always been a very humble, humble moment for me. Um, the, today's lecture, or today's speech is around what do we do about residential schools. And I've had an opportunity to work with my father and see my father do uh, you know, many hundreds of different events that I've watched him uh, be in rooms of the survivors with government people and also with the Canadian public. And uh, w the question has always come up of what is reconciliation and what do we do in this moment and what, are, what can we do today? And uh, this is not a new question because those of us who have dealt with the intergenerational effects of residential schools have deal with this every, every moment of our lives. Every moment that I have, I think about the legacies that I've inherited as an intergenerational survivor and, and how do we handle this. And I want to tell a story of what my father did in our family. Um, my grandfather was a residential school survivor and he was a beautiful man. His name was Henry. And he was a really remarkable man who did a lot of incredible things. He fought for this country in the war, when it, who was unrecognized, unaccepted by this country, but he still went to go fight. He fought with all of his friends and watched many of them be killed. He also endured an incredible amount of hardship by losing the woman that he loved. He also uh, experienced a great deal of trauma returning to this country and being in a country that never really wanted him. And he, he dealt a lot through that through alcohol, and he dealt a lot of that through violence. And he struggled a lot, and he did a lot of really terrible, terrible things growing up. A lot of those stories I still hear about today of people who were harmed by him or that he had uh, been with in those days. Now, my grandfather, I never had an opportunity to see any of that because all I knew growing up was a wonderful, caring, giving, generous man who spent time with me, who I would spend nights at his apartment and take him grocery shopping, and so on. When I was born in 1976, uh, 
I was born uh, right here in Winnipeg, and, uh, and I grew up most of my life here. But um, when my grandfather struggled, he struggled a lot through alcohol, and he, co he coped through alcohol. A lot of that had to do with being a residential school survivor and the trauma that he experienced. Um, when he showed up at the hospital to come and visit me, um, he, showed up, uh, he showed up both at the hospital and then also at the house to visit me. Um, he showed up smelling of alcohol. And my, my father made the decision to tell him and to stand up to his father, which was a, must have been an extremely difficult thing to do, and to tell my grandfather that he would never be around me when he was drinking, ever. And my grandfather, very soon after that, chose to stop drinking. And he chose me over alcohol, which is an incredible gift for me, because all I have known, all I knew after that, was love, generosity, kindness, and forgiveness. And that's the kind of person my father is. He is a brave, courageous man who is committed to the work that he does, is committed to his children, He's also committed to the future of this country in ways that we can never begin to, to think about and the ways that we can see. He's not only a leader amongst Anishinaabe and amongst Indigenous people, but also amongst Canadians. He is a, a head road keeper of the Three Fires Medewin Lodge, uh, who if you ever get a chance to see him in the summertime, take care of that road for the, that last walk that people who are entering the Medewin Lodge take. My, my father is the last person that they see on that journey and they, he walks them around that lodge taking care of them. Um, and he's also, most importantly, an incredible Musham, a grandfather to his beautiful granddaughter, uh, Namijian Nabents, Sarah Fontaine Sinclair. Without further ado, I want to introduce my father, Justice Murray Sinclair. Introductions are always uh, scary for me. That one was particularly scary. Because <laughs> I wasn't quite sure what he was going to say. Uh, but it was a very warm and loving one. And uh, I appreciated the words that he said and what he shared with you. I know that um, people who are asked to do that are always challenged with uh, what to say about me. I have a CV that runs to almost uh, 15 pages now. And uh, when I was at the University of Toronto Law School uh, a few years ago, being introduced by a law student there, she gave up and she said, I have read uh, Justice Sinclair's uh, resume. It's very, very long, and I don't want to read it all to you. So let me tell you that he's a well-rounded man. <laughs> so um, I have learned to appreciate uh, succinctness and accuracy, uh, but I've also learned now to appreciate one who knows me very well. I appreciate, uh, I appreciate that. I want to um, thank the university for inviting me to be here to address you, and I'd like to thank all of you for attending here today. This place is uh, half full. The other half over there is empty, but this side looks very full, uh, and that's nice. And I understand that we're webcasting this to other parts of the world, so it's good that other people might have an opportunity to share some of this as well. Uh, I want to begin with a bit of a caveat um, and to say to those of you who are in the room who are survivors or children of survivors, I'm going to play a video in about five or ten minutes of a survivor's statement. That's a very emotional video. We don't have health support people here. Normally when we do a national event or an event with survivors, we have health supports in the room to help people who might be triggered by something they might hear. Uh, so I want you to know that if you feel you might not be able to listen to a survivor's story, if you want to step out uh, during that time, uh, feel free to do so and then join us again because uh, it can be a pretty intense video. 
And for those of you who are here, who are listening and watching, and those of you who are watching on the webcast, uh, I want you to know for your benefit that this is not uh, a graphic statement. It's not going to go into any detail about uh, what happened, but it will give you a flavor for what the survivors have been telling us at the Commission. And the reason I do that is because uh, there is no way for me to communicate to you just how uh, significant the Truth and Reconciliation Commission has been to us as commissioners, but has been to this country as well, without you having had a chance to hear from the survivors, the ones who have lived through this and who can talk about it most directly. So I want to uh, just give you a heads up about that. Earlier on, we had um, a small reception before we started here, and I wanted to thank my friend Gary Robson and uh, Carl Stone for the, uh, the opening that they did for us at that time and acknowledge that uh, the role of our spiritual advisors, our faith keepers, and doing that work for us is always important to me. And I also want to uh, thank uh, St. Paul's College for putting on that reception in order to give us an opportunity to gather our thoughts and have a conversation before we, we came here. Uh, normally when I attend a place, I always acknowledge that we are on the territory of uh, the traditional keepers of that land, but in this case, you're on my territory. So welcome to my territory. For those of you who may not be uh, aware of the why, why that's important, um, I just want to remind you or ask you to cast your mind back to the Vancouver Olympics in 2012. During the Vancouver Olympics in 2012, the four tribes that were affiliated territorially to the place where the Olympics were being held were always acknowledged at every single activity that the Olympic Committee put on. And uh, initially it was kind of odd because it had never been done at an Olympic event before. But as it went on, it became almost spiritual. It became significant. And it became something uniquely Canadian. It became something that I think as Canadians, we all took great pride in that finally the traditional keepers of the land, the original people of the land, were being acknowledged in a very significant way at a very significant event. And during the opening ceremonies, other activities took place which also made that uh, presence all the more important. So I say whenever you go to a, a location where there are traditional people present and that acknowledgement is given, now you know why. It's a sign of respect. It's a sign of the nature of the relationship that we had initially when uh, people first came to this territory and to this land and to this continent. It was the way of greeting, it was the way of acknowledging those who were here first, and that practice should continue. I, um, first of all, want to um, acknowledge that my colleagues, Commissioner Dr. Marie Wilson and Commissioner Chief Wilton Littlechild are not here with me but on their behalf, I also bring greetings to you and indicate to you that um, I am here speaking to you on behalf of the Commission, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and um, some of the thoughts that I'm going to share with you about the Commission's work and what the Commission is thinking about reconciliation going forward are thoughts that we have discussed many times as Commissioners and will eventually, in one way or the other, find its way into our final report. Some of this, in fact, has found its way into our interim report. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission is a unique entity. I don't want to spend a lot of time talking to you about the actual work of the Commission. I think listening to the survivor will give you a flavor for that. And I don't uh, particularly want to spend a lot of time talking about the history of residential schools. We have issued an interim historical report that will give you some of that as well. I encourage all of you to take a look at the uh, interim report and the historical report that we've issued entitled They Came for the Children because it will give you the information that you need about the history of residential schools. But in order to understand what I'm going to talk to you about, I think you need to know 
a little bit about the Commission, and so let me tell you about the TRC, about its mandate, about the time frame that we've got, and about how we've gone about our work. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission was created as a result of a lawsuit. It's not a government-created commission. It was a commission that was created because the government and various churches that ran residential schools in this country had been sued by survivors who had come out of those schools in a damaged state. Some were damaged emotionally, psychologically, uh, and some were damaged very seriously in a physical way. And so as a result of all of that, a number of lawsuits were started against the government and the churches that ran the schools beginning in the 1980s and continuing through the 1990s and the early part of this century and resulted ultimately in a court-approved settlement agreement called the Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement, which was finalized in 2007. A settlement agreement has several signatories to it, including the Government of Canada, representatives of the Catholic churches, the various Protestant churches, the United Church, Presbyterian Church, the Anglican Church, as well as survivors themselves and the various law firms that uh, also uh, were acknowledged as being parties to the agreement. Because we are not a government commission, we don't report to the government. Uh, and I remind the government of that from time to time because they always seem to forget that we don't report to them. We report to the parties, and our obligation is to advise the parties about the work that we are doing. And ultimately, of course, we will be reporting back to the court which approved the settlement agreement about the work that we have been doing. But we are unique in that respect. We are a commission that was created for two purposes. One, the truth component, which is to look at the history of residential schools in this country and to report upon that in the best way that we can about what we've determined occurred within the schools. And secondly, to initiate and recommend a process of reconciliation that will allow the parties and the country, Aboriginal people and non-Aboriginal people, to be able to come to terms with this past in a way that each side will find mutually acceptable. We begin, though, with this fact that the agreement itself is a flawed agreement, and in itself it contains and creates hurdles to reconciliation, and I want to talk about a few of those to begin with. First of all, not all of the schools that were attended by Aboriginal children in this country are included in the agreement. 140 schools are listed in the settlement agreement, and there is a provision to ask that other schools be added. The request initially must go to the Government of Canada, which can agree to add it or not add it. And there is a right to ask an oversight committee to overrule the government if you're not happy with Canada's decision. And ultimately, you can seek a court decision as to whether or not a school should be included in a settlement agreement or not. But there are very strict conditions about how a school can be added to the settlement agreement. The government of Canada says, and the courts have supported this position, that only those schools where children actually resided and where the government jointly or primarily managed the residential portion of the school can be added to the set settlement agreement. Requests have been made to add over 1,300 other schools in Canada to the settlement agreement. And what that tells you is that Aboriginal children over the course of time since Confederation were sent to residential schools totaling over 1,300 in number throughout this country. And over 1,300 of them have been excluded from the settlement agreement. And that excludes, therefore, a lot of students. And that in its of itself is going to create a significant challenge to the process of reconciliation that I'll talk about in a moment. The settlement agreement creates two compensation funds that you should be aware of. First one is called a Common Experience Fund, to which every student who resided at one of the schools listed in the agreement can apply and receive a payment. The payment schedule provides that every student who attended one of the residential schools can receive $10,000 
for the first year that they were in attendance at the school, and then $3,000 for each subsequent year. Approximately 105,500 students have applied for compensation to the Common Experience Fund, and 79,179 of them have been approved, so just under 80% have been approved for a Common Experience Payment. The total amount paid under the Common Experience Payment Fund has been $1.6 billion. That's billion with a B. The average payment has been $19,412, so an average of about uh, four years of schooling. The second fund that is set aside for students to apply for compensation is what is called the Independent Assessment Fund. That fund is for those who suffered a personal, serious personal injury while at the school. Now there's a list of injuries that are set out in the schedule to the settlement agreement, which you can look at. And if those of you who are interested in seeing what that schedule says can go to the website called uh, Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement.ca and take a look at that list. But in order to uh, make a claim against the fund, you have to qualify by identifying which of those injuries you sustained while you were at the school, and you have to support that through testimony, either of yourself or others, and through other evidence such as medical reports showing that you have suffered a serious injury at the hands of another person, whether that person is a staff person or another student or somebody who is on the grounds with permission of the school, the injury itself has to have occurred on the school grounds. Just less than half of those who attended residential schools have made claims for serious personal injuries. A total of 37,000 approximately claims have been made out of the 79,000 common experience payees. The total payment so far for serious personal injuries that have been resolved to this point in time is approximately $2.3 billion. The average claimant has received approximately $115,000. There are still thousands of claims left to be heard. Only about half of them have been resolved so far and it is predicted that the claims hearing process is going to take until the end of 2017 before all of the claims are resolved. Now, as I told you, the settlement agreement itself has created its own set of feelings, negative and otherwise, about the process among survivors. Firstly, the exclusion of such a large number of schools from the settlement agreement, all of which were provably attended by Aboriginal children, at the insistence of the government, but which the government says it did not manage or run itself. In other words, the government ordered the children to go to the school, but the school was left in the hands of others to manage. An example of that would be, would be for example, Frontier School Division here in Manitoba, ran a residential school in northern Manitoba, attended by many First Nations children, paid for by the federal government, but which was run by the province. In that case, anybody who attended that school is not eligible for compensation under the settlement agreement. Even if the school was run by a church entity in partnership with the government of Canada, it was not necessarily entitled, a person is not necessarily entitled to compensation. Also, claimants who have filed a claim but are unable to testify by the time of their hearing, either due to infirmity, poor health, or death also lose their claim by the time the hearing has taken place. And the pace at which hearings take place is like any other trial process, very slow. And as a result, there is some frustration around that. There are claims of abuse being made to us by survivors about the way that their lawyers have treated them in the course of preparing for their claims as well as preparing for the hearings. There are complaints about lawyer fees, the slow pace of the hearings, 
and the process by which the claims are heard and resolved by adjudicators appointed by the Government of Canada, all of which have contributed to an entirely unforeseen set of issues calling for a reconciliation process outside of the TRC mandate, and that process may never occur. In addition, students who attended residential schools but did not reside there, what are called day students, are not eligible for the first level of compensation, despite the fact that while they were in the schools, they were treated abusively, and not necessarily physically, in the very same way as those who did reside there. Métis students who attended church-run schools are also left out of the agreement. So as I've said, this has created a significant class of former students excluded from the agreement and its compensation processes, although we have included them in our processes. As a commission, we have taken the view that to be effective, any process of reconciliation must include all Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal persons in Canada. The road to reconciliation, however, will not be easy so long as so many Aboriginal people continue to feel aggrieved by the compensation process itself without having their grievances recognized. There are class actions that have been commenced as a result of those exclusions. The Métis people have started a class action against the government and the churches for the abuses they experienced at the schools that they attended. Students in Labrador, Newfoundland, all of whose schools have been excluded from the agreement because of Labrador, Newfoundland's late entry into Confederation, are also beginning a class action against the government of Canada. And the day students who are not entitled to receive compensation for attending any school are also starting a class action against the government of Canada. And all of those legal actions are still pending and are still remaining to be resolved and all of which are going to stand in the way of a full process of reconciliation. And so that's why we say as a commission, reconciliation is not going to occur in our lifetime, but we hope that at least we can begin the conversation. The settlement agreement created the commission, I've told you that. And what I mean by that though is the survivors themselves negotiated for the commission. The survivors agreed to set aside $60 million of compensation money so that it can be used to pay for the Commission's work and purposes. And we were asked by the survivors and under the agreement to complete our work within five years. Canada and the other parties are legally obligated to support the work of this Commission. And we have reminded them through three different court applications that they still have to do that. While our mandate originally was five years and was to end on July the 1st of 2013, you may remember, however, the first set of commissioners who were appointed in 2008 were unable to continue to work together. And in the fall of 2008, the commission chair at that time resigned, necessitating the appointment of new commissioners to head the commission. We were appointed effective July 1 of 2009 with a renewed five-year mandate to July 1st of 2014. And that mandate has been extended by one year to June 30th of 2015 because of a court action that we had to take in which we showed that the government of Canada and the Catholics had not performed their document production in a timely way for the commission to be able to write its report. Uh, five years is not a very long time to do the work that we have been asked to do. The timeline was understandably short, though, to begin with. Given the average age of survivors at the time that the settlement agreement was negotiated, time was clearly of the essence. The average age of survivors at that time was 67 years of age. It now is at just over 71 years of age and survivors are dying by the dozens every month. It's important that we complete our work as a commission, or at least as much of it as we can in the time period that we've got, because we want survivors to be around to see what it is that we are able to find and to show. 
I feel strongly as the chair of the commission that as a commission, we must deliver a report to survivors by the end of the time period that we have committed to on July the 1st of 2015. But as I've said, we know and we have warned the survivors and others that reconciliation cannot be achieved in five years. So we have taken the approach that our role as commissioners is to identify what reconciliation means, where it should take us, and in the context of these times, what the parties, Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal, need to do in order to get there. The first obligation of the Commission, though, is to get the full and complete story of residential schools. And our second obligation, to inspire and direct a process of healing and reconciliation in this country, is now the role that we have undertaken with great seriousness. Certain rights that the Commission have and the duties of the parties identified in the agreement help to clarify and facilitate what we must do now as a Commission going forward. And we begin with this thought as a Commission, that the TRC's work and mandate and the settlement agreement itself is all about the education of children. We have been directed to investigate the way that Aboriginal children were educated by the government and churches of this country for 125 years. Educational initiatives are part of the work that we do as a Commission, which requires us to reveal to all Canadians the true and full and complete story of that system. So the story of residential schools, generally, is a story about education. However, we feel that it is precisely because education was the primary tool of oppression of Aboriginal people and the miseducation of all Canadians that we have concluded that education holds the key to reconciliation. And that's because education is important. In order for any society to function properly and to its full capacity, it must raise and educate its children so that they can answer what philosophers, including Aboriginal elders, call the great questions of life. And those questions are, where do I come from? Where am I going? Why am I here? And who am I? Children need to know the answers to those questions. And it begins by knowing your personal story, including that part of your story which precedes your birth. We all need to know the stories of our parents and our grandparents. We all need to, to know the stories of our direct and our indirect ancestors. And we need to know the stories of our real and mythological heroes and villains. And as part of that story, we also need, the story, need to know the story about the community of people to which we belong, that is, our collective story, all the way back to our place in the creation of this world. And we all have a creation story, and we all need to know what it is. We also need to learn that not all creation stories are the same, but that all creation stories are true. That's an important teaching about respect, and understanding that is an important lesson for all children. The second question talks about where are we going? And that second question is an important need that all of us have. It's a natural outcome of knowing where you've come from as an individual and as a people. Knowing where you're going is not just about where you're going to be next week or next year or in 25 years. It's about that, but it's also about what happens to us when we die. It's about the spirit world. It's about life after death and a reaffirmation of the role of the Creator in matters of life and death. It's about belief, it's about faith, and it's about hope. And knowing why you are here, that third question, is also related to the first two questions. Knowing one's creation story is always imbued with teachings about why the Creator made this creation to begin with and what our place as human beings was intended to be within it. But the answer to that third question is also about knowing what role you play in the world, including in your community of people. It's about knowing whether your purpose is fulfilled through being an artist or a leader or a warrior 
or a caregiver or a healer or a helper. Clan teachings and naming ceremonies in my own culture provide answers about that. But the answer to that question is also influenced by knowing what your family and community need and then filling that need and feeling the satisfaction that derives from it. And the fourth question, who am I, is the most important question because it is the one that we are always asking and always answering. It is the constant question. It is influenced by everything and everyone. We fight to maintain the answer we like and we fight to change and to improve the answers we don't. We strive to attain the perfect answer by the time we die, not real realizing that in fact there is no right or wrong answer. It is a question about understanding our life. It is about identity. It is about what you have become. But it is also about what you want to become. That is why it is constant. For our children who were raised in residential schools, the answers to those questions were denied to them. And instead, they were placed in an environment of oppression virtually from the day that they attended. And I can tell you all about that in great detail. But as I said, you will only learn effectively about it by listening to a survivor. So I'd like to play the first video so that you can hear what it is that one survivor told us at one of our hearings. I thought I would be brave to face the demons that haunted me for 49 years. But I see today and, and since Monday that it still affects me for the things that happened through the 49 years that I kept hidden in me. I left uh, home and I didn't know why or where I was going, but I went into a plane with my sister and brother back, back in 1960, 62, 61, 62. And then we came to this building that used to sit across here. And then they separated us. I don't know why they separated us, but like stories I've heard, their clothes were taken, mine was taken as well. My parents bought me some clothing before I came to, to, to Grolier Hall. And it was taken from me and I had to wear what they had given to me. My winter clothes also was taken. Never did see them again. After a separation my, from my sister and brother, I wasn't able to speak to them again. My mom come to visit me at one time and I couldn't even see her. And I was taken from my bed with my mouth covered and into the and I don't remember going into the room his room. I developed a scab between my crotch from my, from my, below my belly button right down through my in, inner thighs. I don't know how long I was like that, but I had to walk with my legs spread and I was too scared to go see the sister, the nun, or the, the, the nurse because I didn't know what to say. Somehow it got healed, but I carried that, that sexual abuse and assault for 49 years. And that's what impacted that residential, that, not the residential school, but the person impacted my life until I was 49. My, First wife passed away in 2007. She never even knew about this. But I, but I contemplated suicide in 1989. 
But it's by the grace of God that I sit here today. It's by the grace of God that he stopped me from going to the rifles in the porch when I was going to it. And I stopped. I thought, what are my children and my wife is going to say? How are they going to live seeing their dad dead on, in the porch? I no longer live by the number 142. I'm Paul Budrak, and I have the right to live. And I have the right to be happy because I know I deserve it. And my children, if they can hear me, they have the right to come say, Dad, we didn't like what you did. And I can say I know and I'm sorry. And I thank this gathering here for, for listening to my story. It hasn't been an easy road, but we're not alone in it. Thank you. I think it's really important that um, uh, survivors have the courage to tell their story to this commission. Sure, we, we're still emotional, but they become less and less the more you, you talk about it and you deal with uh, people who can help you in that, in that field, that, you know, that the abuse that you suffered, uh, eventually you're going to have to let it go. Through these type of events with a lot of support and stuff like that, we can share our stories, we can be, uh, begin healing, and maybe that's why I turned out to be the person the way I was. I don't think I was the best parent. I don't know, that kind of hurts. Uh, you know, uh, those things are the ones that are painful. Uh, I just want to be able to, for the friends that we lost, uh, the onus is on me to take this forward. And doing so, it's going to help me heal. But the one thing, though, Your Honor, they didn't respect people with disability. I had a problem with, I had a hearing problem. I was mocked. I was teased. I was picked on. But when I went to school here, the hostel was so bad, but when I went to school, I was happy. Any kind of occasion that went on, I was happy, because as long as I was away from Stringer Hall, I kept it in sight. I kept it in sight. Never told my parents about it. Your Honor, these kind of things we went through in school, we had no right at all. Thank you. It took you how many years to get it out of your system? Uh, today. Yeah. Today. I never told my kids about it. I can't run away anymore. It's no use running because uh, the older you get, you. Uh, might not get another chance, you know, to tell your daughters what actually happened. So um, I would encourage other people to take advantage of the TRC. It, it can only help a person. For the children who attended residential schools in this country, and um, those stories are just a few of the many thousands that we have heard and are just representative of the many thousands that have had to testify before the adjudicators. All of the questions that, of life that I have talked about remained unanswered because the schools themselves did not provide anything in the form of an appropriate education for the first 80 years or so of their existence. There were no educational standards to speak for, to speak of. There were no properly trained teachers that were in place for most of the history of the schools. It was only until, it wasn't until after the 1930s that they began to try to develop curriculum materials and try to develop proper qualifications for those who were brought into the schools. All of the questions were unfulfilled for them and therefore they grew up not knowing the answers that were so important to them, the answers that are important to you as well. And they were forced to accept answers that ran counter, in fact, to the information 
and knowledge that they already carried from their early lives as children in their own families and in their own communities. In my culture, for example, as it is true for all other cultures, your first teacher is your mother, and your first classroom is your family home. And what you learn in those very important formative years influences you for life. And as you grow, you look for things that reinforce what you learned from your mother or your grandmother or your uncles and aunties or your dad. Indian residential schools denied children who attended the schools all of that and tried to squash their curiosity. The schools were all about changing the identities of Indigenous children. But how can one do that when there is so much information bred in your bones and into which you were born that is not consistent with the identity that you are being told you must take on? It's a question that many survivors have asked us to try to address in our report. It is difficult to believe that you can live and be just like just like a white man, we have been told, when a brown face always stares back at you in the mirror. The potential for internal conflict was enormous, and that potential was never recognized by those who came up with the idea that residential schools could work. I was at a conference once when I heard a young man complain, it's hard being an Indian, to which a survivor responded, but it's harder not being one when you know you are. But that only explains one side of the issue. There are others as well. We are governed in our approach to reconciliation with this thought. The way that we have all been educated in this country, all of us, Aboriginal children in residential schools, non-Aboriginal children and many other Aboriginal children in the public schools and other schools of this country, has brought us to where we are today to a point where the psychological and emotional well-being of Aboriginal children has been harmed and the relationship between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people has been seriously damaged and is in need of repair. That is so, not just in terms of what was taught or not taught about residential schools, but also in terms of what Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people have been taught about each other. It is our view that in broad terms, education has brought us to the, the poor state of poor relations between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal peoples in this country, but education holds the key to making things better. And we know that making things better will not happen overnight. It will take generations. It will take concerted effort over a number of generations. But remember, that's how the damage was created and that's how the damage will be fixed. But if we agree on the objective of reconciliation, and if we agree to work together, then the work that we do today will immeasurably strengthen the social fabric of this country tomorrow. And even in an era of fiscal restraint, when spending more money faces constant challenges, much of what we need to do can be accomplished without spending more money. It starts with examining the way that our educational systems are going about their work and seeing if we can change that to begin with. Now, I'm sure that you've heard other stories, including the ones that you heard here today, about the horrific abuse that some have suffered at the hands of those who ran the schools. The stories of abuse have, in fact, dominated the conversation about residential schools to this point. But it is not the complete story. In fact, the statistics tell us that most children were not physically and sexually abused in the schools. Of the 80,000 claimants for common experience payments paid for, for merely attending the schools, it's anticipated that about 25 to 30,000 are likely to be able to prove claims for serious injury arising from an act of abuse. But that means that 40,000 will not be able to and have no interest in doing so. But although not all of them were physically abused in that way or suffered serious personal injury, all the children who went to those schools have been damaged in some way, some without even realizing it. 
Physical and sexual abuse are not the only source of trauma in one's life. The separation from parents at such a young age, being subjected to a climate of fear, of loneliness, of hostility, and of oppression would have, an, would have been enough to cause enormous personal damage to any child, especially when combined with the child's long-term institutionalization and isolation from family. Such matters, in fact, dominate the testimony of survivors when they discuss the schools. Even in the stories we have heard about how some survivors feel that the schools took them from home environments that were violent or neglectful and impoverished and gave them opportunities they would never otherwise had, we must always keep in mind that we are talking about home environments that have largely been created by the legacy of residential schools. The past several generations of survivors were invariably intergenerational survivors of parents who went to the schools. And it's sort of like saying that the child welfare system is saving children from neglect and harm without acknowledging that the conditions of neglect and harm from which the children are being saved were in fact caused by the government. Canada and the provinces have created a child welfare system that is purportedly saving the children without acknowledging that it was the federal and provincial school systems that helped to destroy the families, the children who went to the schools, and the families that they're being saved from. It's hard and illogical, therefore, to give the so-called savior credit when in the eyes of the Aboriginal community, the savior is the primary perpetrator. You also are aware that the schools have been closed now and are no longer in operation, and that this has been so for at least one generation. In fact, Canada's Indian residential schools had pretty much closed by the 1980s. But I want to assure you, if it isn't already obvious, that the legacy of those schools is very much alive with us today. It lives on in the daily experiences of the survivors in this country who attended the schools. You heard from Paul Vudrak, and he told you what it was like living with the legacy of schools in his life. It lives on in their attitude about themselves. It lives on in the opportunities that are and are not open to them. And it lives on in their children who do not know their languages, who do not know their cultures, and who were denied the chance to gain a sense of self-respect from schools that constantly portrayed their people as savages, as heathens, as uncivilized, as treacherous, as sneaky, dishonest, thieving, and irrelevant. It lives on in the lives of Aboriginal parents who spent years living in institutions where they would never have learned how to parent properly because they were denied the chance to observe and to receive positive parenting from their own parents or to participate in any kind of normal family life. And it lives on in the lives of the children and grandchildren of those parents. A great accumulation of damage has been done to Aboriginal cultures, languages, families, and communities by residential schools. But the legacy of the thinking that was the driving force behind residential schools also lives on in the attitudes and the ignorance of Canadians of my generation and other generations as, as well who have received the accepted teachings and prejudices of the past. It wasn't just Indian residential schools that bear the blame for the current situation the public school systems do as well. And a great deal of damage has been done to the relationship between Aboriginal people and all other Canadians because non-Aboriginal people have been educated not to respect Aboriginal people. Sadly, even in our public schools, Aboriginal children have been taught about this country, about themselves and about their place in the world in a manner which has caused them shame and humiliation. And if you don't believe this, then you do not understand the implications of the continuing high dropout rates of Aboriginal children in public schools. Part of what the Truth and Reconciliation Commission does, as you know, is to travel across Canada to listen to the public statements of residential school survivors and their children, the intergenerational survivors as we call them. 
We have also heard from many who worked in the schools. Our intent is to tell a balanced story. And some of the stories, as you have heard, are very, very moving. These are public events, of course, and the public, a certain portion of it at least, is interested and is riveted and has been riveted by what has been heard. We have visited hundreds of communities in this country so far, and we have heard thousands of statements and recorded every one of them. In almost every community where we have met non-Aboriginal persons who have spoken to us about what they have heard and seen, and they have been in the audience, some of them, sometimes several of them, have come up to me and have said, I didn't know any of this. I really didn't know any of it. I attended school in this province, in this town, in this city. I attended high school. I went to university here in Canada, and I didn't learn about any of this. I had my entire schooling here, and I was never taught a thing about Indian residential schools or the laws that were passed to maintain them. And so you and other Canadians have been taught little or nothing about Indian residential schools. But you and others were probably taught something, one way or another, about the history of Canada and about the role that historians and those who wrote the textbooks saw of Aboriginal peoples in that history. You were probably taught, for instance, that the history of Canada and the history of North America began in 1492 when Columbus sailed the ocean blue, or when John Cabot and Jacques Cartier landed on a very small piece of land in the eastern part of this great continent and claimed the entire place for foreign power. Penny Clark of the University of British Columbia writes about the portrayal of Aboriginal people in English history textbooks in her work entitled Teaching the Violent Past, History, Education, and Reconciliation. And Dr. Clark divides the treatment of Aboriginal people in textbooks prior to 1970 into six general categories. Firstly, she says, Aboriginal people are spoken about as spectator or bystander, basically irrelevant to the main narrative of the text and to the narrative of history of this country. And secondly, she says, Aboriginal people are spoken about as savage warriors, a danger lurking in the background of the settler's story. And thirdly, she says, Aboriginal people are spoken about as uniquely spiritual, followers of mystical beliefs, naive to the forces at play around them and victim to their lack of astuteness. Fifthly, she says, Aboriginal people are seen as a problem and are spoken about that way. And Aboriginal people are seen as protester or invisible to the continuing narrative. Our Canadian history textbooks have talked about the history of this country as a nation-building exercise, and it's been the main theme of Canada's history curricula for a long time. And Aboriginal people, except for a few notable exceptions often trotted out just to prove the rule, have been portrayed as bystanders or obstacles to the enterprise of nation-building. Dr. Ken Osborne, a former professor of education here at this university has specialized in the teaching of history. And he's writing a book about the history of the teaching of history in Canada. And he's allowed us to quote from his unpublished manuscript. And this is what he says. In both English language and French language textbooks, the First Nations were typically assigned the textbook equivalent of a reserve, a segregated first chapter of a quasi-ethnographic nature in which they appeared to live in a timeless past that was now outdated and best forgotten. Before the 1970s, textbooks overwhelmingly saw Canadian history as beginning with the arrival of Europeans in North America. And with the arrival of Europeans, the First Nations made an occasional cameo appearance in their early history of the context of the fur trade briefly in the War of 1812, and finally as an obstacle to European settlement of the West. Totally lost was any sense of Aboriginal culture as a successful adaptation to the physical environment 
and of Aboriginal life as self-sustaining and self-sufficient in its own terms. And Dr. Osborne goes on to say, Europeans had religion. Aboriginal peoples had superstitions and strange ideas about the things around them. Europeans held ceremonies. Aboriginal people indulged in orgies. Europeans had technology. Aboriginal peoples used crude inventions. Europeans had doctors. Aboriginal peoples had medicine men who worked their cures, quote, by beating drums, by dancing, and by howling. So why, in 2014, am I referring to academic research into the way Aboriginal peoples were represented in textbooks prior to the 1970s? Well, there are two reasons I want to tell you about. Firstly, many of today's leading and prominent Canadians attended school and university in that era, long before educational authorities began to take their first critical look at curricula as it relates to Aboriginal peoples. That education has influenced each and every one of us. As an Aboriginal student, I can tell you from my experience that it denied to me any sense of pride about the role of my ancestors in the history of this part of the world. And for my non-Aboriginal classmates, it taught, taught them that we were wild and savage and uncivilized, and that given the conditions of Aboriginal people in modern society, we had not advanced very far from that state. My non-Aboriginal classmates were taught to be proud of the accomplishments of their ancestors in taming this wild country and wrestling it from the hands of the savages in establishing this wonderful nation now known as Canada and to take pride in the advanced civilizations from which their ancestors came, even though the 17th century philosopher Thomas Hobbes observed that the life of the English commoner at that time was, quote, solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. So my education in the public schools of this country lacked relevance for me. And this was so even though I was very successful at it. But that success came at a price. It taught me and it taught all others who were in classes with me that my people were irrelevant. And by implication, it caused me to feel that I was too. It taught us to believe in the inferiority of Aboriginal people and in the inherent superiority of white European civilization. And in order to get the grades that I did, I was compelled to repeat that unconscious mantra. The system of my day did not teach us to respect Aboriginal people because it never told us anything about the Aboriginal presence in this country that showed the humanity of the people. In public schools, we were all educated to be the same. And if we, as Aboriginal students, rebelled, resisted, or rejected that process, we were weeded out, or we weeded ourselves out. Of all of the Aboriginal students that I started grade one with, very few ever graduated from high school. Even my brother and my sister, who will tell you without hesitation that they are much smarter than me, failed to graduate from high school. But though I and others have succeeded in that system, it was not without cost to our own, own humanity and our own sense of self-respect. As Negon has told you, I have a granddaughter. Sarah is her English name. Nemijian Nibance is her spirit name. And that's how I like to call her. Now, she's very special to me. She loves to hear stories, especially Nanabush stories, stories of the trickster of our people. And yet, from time to time, I like to tell her other stories as well, children's stories that you all know. Goldilocks and the Three Bears, The Three Little Pigs, Little Red Riding Hood, and Jack and the Beanstalk are among her favorites, mainly because I think I'm a pretty good giant. I have a pretty believable bear voice, and I make a hell of a big bad wolf. But I like to tell her my favorite story, 
from my childhood, and that's the story of the ugly duckling. The story of the little duckling who was mocked and teased and bullied mercilessly by his brothers and sisters and all of his friends and by all of the other ducks for being ugly is a touching story to me. His sadness and his humiliation and his loneliness marked his life in the story. He wanted so hard to be like all the other ducks, but he was never treated well, and he always felt like he never fit in. He began to feel and believe that he was ugly. He felt he was a failure. He felt rejected, and he felt lost. But then, one day, he discovered that he was not a duck. He was, in fact, a beautiful, beautiful swan. He did not learn that from the ducks, however. He learned that himself from seeing, observing, and learning from other swans. He discovered who he really was, and he discovered that what others called ugly was, in fact, a thing of great beauty. His happiness at that discovery was one that I felt as I read that story as a child, in which I felt as I told it to my Sarah. And when I tell her that story, I tell her that she too is a beautiful, beautiful swan, no matter what others might tell her. And it makes her feel good, I think, to hear that from her mushu. But what I haven't been able to tell her yet, because she's still too young, is that I was raised to believe that I was an ugly duckling. And despite my very significant duck skills, I always felt shame and confusion and sadness because I did not feel like a duck. When she is old enough to understand, I will tell her about the day I became a swan, when I realized that I was a strong and beautiful Anishinaabe man and that there were many things about being an Anishinaabe that belonged to me. And I think she'll have to know that part of my story someday soon, perhaps. But the second reason why I talk about the work of those academics who looked at what we were taught before 1970 is because it takes a long time and a great deal of concerted effort to turn around damaging public attitudes that were cultivated over decades and even centuries. Mainstream Canadians see the dysfunction of Aboriginal communities today, but they have no idea how that happened, what caused it, or how government contributed to that reality through such actions and policies as residential schools. In that environment, it becomes easy to blame Aboriginal people for their lot in life and for their failure to overcome it as others have. So I want to say something about the current state of education in Canada, because as I said earlier, education holds the key to reconciliation. And let me tell you why. Now I know that education has changed from my day, but the question that we have to ask ourselves is whether it has changed enough. There certainly have been genuine attempts to reform what our children, Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal, are taught about Aboriginal peoples in Canada, and even about the Indian residential school system itself. Just the other day, you may recall the Treaty Commission of Manitoba, under the leadership of Jamie Wilson, announced the development of educational materials for all grade levels in Manitoba to teach all children about the importance and nature of treaties here in Manitoba, and to understand the importance of the statement that we are all treaty people. But what about residential schools? And what about the history of Aboriginal people generally? The Legacy of Hope Foundation and the Aboriginal Healing Foundation commissioned an environmental scan by Curriculum Services Canada of the curriculum being used in Canadian elementary schools, in secondary schools, and post-secondary programs just within the past decade. The purpose was to produce a comprehensive picture of how the topic of Indian residential schools is included in provincial curricula across the country and to identify opportunities for improvement. Curriculum Services published its report in June 2011. And the report concluded 
that the status of curriculum regarding Indian residential school varies across the country greatly. From recently revised to revision in progress to curriculum that is several years old. And in much of the provincial and territorial curriculum, they say, content on residential schools is limited, and if presented, is often a subset of a broad context. Now, I don't want to dismiss the broad context, because the broad context is obviously crucial. All students, Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal, need to learn that the history of this country did not begin in 1492, or even with the arrival of Vikings hundreds of years earlier. They need to learn about the Aboriginal nations that the Europeans met. They need to learn about their rich linguistic and cultural heritage, about what they felt and what they thought as they dealt with such historic figures as Champlain and Laverandre and the representatives of the Hudson's Bay Company. They need to learn why they negotiated the treaties and that they negotiated them with purpose and with integrity and in good faith. They need to learn why Aboriginal leaders and elders today fight so hard to defend those poorly worded treaties and what they represent to them and why they have been ignored by European governments and Euro-Canadian settlers. They need to learn what it means to have inherent rights and what those are for Aboriginal people and the settler government's obligations in those areas where treaties have never been negotiated in the first place. And they need to learn of the many issues that are ongoing and have been ongoing historically and why. They need to learn that the doctrine of discovery, the politically and socially accepted basis for European claims to the land and riches of this country, has never been accepted in a Canadian court and has been repudiated, in fact, around the world recently by the United Nations itself and by the World Council of Churches. But this is not enough. As I said before, mainstream Canadians see the dysfunction of Aboriginal communities, but they have no idea how that happened, what caused it, or how government contributed to that reality through residential schools and the policies and laws that were in place during their existence. Our education system, through omission or commission, has failed to do that. And misunderstanding, ignorance, and racism has resulted on the one hand, and shame, humiliation, a lack of self-respect, and anger has occurred on the other. The educational systems of this country bear a large share of the responsibility for the current state of affairs. But it can fix what it has broken. And what our education systems need to do is this. It must commit to teaching Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal children, our children, how to speak respectfully to and about each other in the future. It begins with teaching them the truth about our history in this country. Knowing what happened will lead to understanding. Understanding will lead to respect. And reconciliation is all about respect. The relationship between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people in this country must be founded on mutual respect. But we must not lose sight of the threshold importance of ensuring that, firstly, Aboriginal children are given an opportunity to develop their own self-respect. That must come first. And so, before I conclude, there are a couple of points I just want to tell you. A legacy of hope has, in fact, developed a comprehensive, high-quality package about residential schools that I want to commend to all of you, particularly those of you who are looking at education as a career. Its focus is on the inclusion of residential schools and educational curricula. It's a strong beginning to the development of important initiatives. And I encourage all of you who are interested in curriculum development generally to look at what they have done. And I also do want to acknowledge that some jurisdictions have developed curriculum changes concerning Indian residential schools. Manitoba, for example, is piloting an initiative for middle school years. Curriculum material has been developed in residen on residential schools in British Columbia. Alberta teaches residential schools as a subtopic of its mandatory social studies curriculum 
and recently has committed to ensure that every single child at every single grade level in their provincial school system will be taught about residential schools. The Northwest Territories and Nunavut have recently announced that the history of Indian residential schools will be a mandatory component of their curriculum. And in Manitoba and Saskatchewan, the task of persuasion has been made easier by the work of their respective treaty commissions, which have done great work in having treaties and treaty making taught in all schools on the basis that we are all treaty people. And while subtopics such as residential schools and the treaties are important, they do need to be seen as a starting point to the development of a comprehensive approach to the inclusion of materials that fully discuss the history of this country, materials that give full and proper respect to Aboriginal people and bring balance to the nature of the historical and current relationships between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal peoples in this country. And I also want to acknowledge the hurdles that educational leaders face in trying to introduce new curricula. I know that there is fierce competition from other subject areas. I know that the current pedagogical approach across this country emphasizes critical skill development rather than content knowledge. And I know that it's expensive to develop materials for use in just one province or one territory. Economies of scale work against efforts to develop materials that are particularly relevant in a specific jurisdiction. I acknowledge all of this. I have no interest in making this sound easier than it is. But here is my concern. This is a thought I want to leave you with. If programs which deal with the experience of Aboriginal people in this country are taught only as electives and not as mandatory, at least by the senior grades, even if they deal extensively and appropriately with the Indian residential school system, Aboriginal people, and the fallout from the residential school experience, I expect that I will still be approached in five, 10, or 15 years from now by people saying to me, you know, I received my education in this province and I never heard a single thing about Indian residential schools. And I want to prevent that from happening. In July of 2012, I had the opportunity to address all of the ministers of education of this country at their regular meeting in Halifax. And here's what I said to them. I am, making, I am asking you this morning for a commitment to embark on a process that will result in changes in the curricula of your particular province or territory, changes that will ensure that every single child who is educated in the jurisdiction you represent is taught about Indian residential schools in the course of his or her education that every single child that is educated in your jurisdiction learns about the treatment of Aboriginal people and the historical relationships between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people in this country. I am asking you to establish a timeline for this process and for a personal commitment to see that this process bears fruit. And now that you know that, I ask each and every one of you, as citizens and residents of this great country, to help us to see that that is accomplished. Thank you very much. I think I'm supposed to encourage you to ask questions, but probably some of you are beginning to faint from hunger, so I'll leave it in the hands of the organizers as to what the next step is going to be. Thank you very much. Thank you, Justice Sinclair, for your words and for your humanity. 
We are so glad that all of you in the audience are here today. Now we have this amazing opportunity to share some questions with Justice Sinclair and hear his perspectives. If you'd like to pose a question, Ms. Annette Jones and Ms. Bonnie Warkentine have two roving mics, um, so please raise your hand. Hello, uh, thank you for your uh, um, great oratory skills, uh, Justice Sinclair. Uh, my name is Sandra Henry and I come from the Treaty 4 area of Weiwei Sakapo. And I was just wondering, with the intergenerational impacts of residential schools, is there going to be a component that addresses the Sisti Scoop children? In our report, you mean? Uh, yeah, like, or is there anything going to be flowing from that? Like, I, that's my intergenerational place in this whole situation. My father was, uh, attended the residential school. And when we came, when he left, well, he didn't leave. I mean, he ran away. He ran away. My grandfather. Every time my father ran back home, my grandfather would beat him and send him back. And so the third time, my father just left. So he was on his own when he was, what, 14 years old. And then eventually moved on to have a, a family, which is where I come along. I'm the oldest in nine of us in our family, and I'm still dealing with that impact of residential school because my family was split up through the child welfare system. And at this point, right now, I'm still fighting with the United States to bring one of my brothers home from being incarcerated for 27 years. So it's, it's still very fresh, still very raw, the impacts of, of what has happened to our people. And I'm a mother, I'm a mother, I'm a grandmother, I'm a daughter and I'm a sister. And I'm just standing here to share with you, like, there's still so many issues that our people are dealing with, and this is just one of the things um, that I would like to know if the commission would, can make uh, reference to the next generation of kids that are coming up in the system. Thank you. Um, just so you know, um, the. Um We've been asked uh, many times whether we're going to talk about the transition from residential schools to children being apprehended by the child welfare system. And the answer to that is yes, we are. Uh, but the, uh, it has become clear to us at the commission that the residential school system was, in, was not in fact a school system. It was a child welfare system. And it was a child welfare system virtually from the beginning. The intention from the beginning was to take children away from parents who the government felt were not going to provide them with the kind of education, treatment, and upbringing that the government wanted those children to have. And so they were put into care in an institution where the government felt that they would receive the kind of upbringing that the government wanted them to receive. And that's the child welfare system. That's not a school system. And the fact that for the first 75 years that the schools were in existence, uh, the teachers didn't have to be credentialed, that in fact there was no teaching to begin with of any kind of material. None of the children who went to residential schools in this country ever graduated from those schools to be able to go on to a post-secondary education. Every person who completed their education in a residential school then had to go to a public school to get credentialed so they could go on. Um, and the, uh, the fact that there was no curriculum in place until the 1940s all tells us that the intention behind the system was to apprehend children and place them into care so the government could do something with them. And so that's what we're going to say, that the residential school system was really about um, apprehending children and keeping them away from their families. The, um, in addition to that, uh, after the um, uh, United Nations Declaration of Human Rights in the late 1940s, the government of Canada was faced with the dilemma that the residential schools were in fact a significant breach of human rights. And therefore, they started to get children uh, placed in the schools after the parents had signed a consent form transferring guardianship of the child to the uh, Department of Indian Affairs. 
And so beginning in 1950 or thereabouts, uh, all children who were placed in residential schools uh, effectively had their guardianship transferred to the government, uh, indicating furthermore that it was a residential, it was, it was not a school system, it was a child welfare system. And the government then took the position that they had the right to make uh, placement decisions about those children. Many children after 1950 were not in fact allowed to go home as long as they were still under the age of 21 because that's the age of majority that was in place in most jurisdictions. And uh, the government uh, took the view that if they um, were finished being educated, so to speak, then the government would decide what happened to them afterwards. And many of them were then transferred into care with provincial child welfare agencies. And when the uh, schools started to close down, the government made a decision after the Second World War to start to close the schools down. Um, in the 1960s, then they started to transfer those children from residential school care into child welfare care in the provincial jurisdictions. So when you see the massive influx of children into the, chi into the child welfare system in the 60s, the so-called 60s scoop, a lot of those are kids that are being transferred from residential schools into the provincial child welfare system. Uh, so there's a very clear connection. So uh, the answer to your question is we're going to write about that and we're going to point out the connections and we are going to talk about the implications of that. We also intend to show how there are connections between the incarceration rates of Aboriginal people beginning in the 1960s and residential schools and we're also going to talk about the, the missing and murdered women of Canada today and how that is connected back to residential schools as well. So all of that is um, going to be part of our report. Thank you very much for a wonderful address. And there's so much in it that I'm almost afraid to make a comment. But will there be a script available uh, so that one could reflect on this and think about it and maybe send in some feedback? That's one, that's a question. But another comment, I value very much your reference to the important questions of life. And I very value very much what I have learned from the Inuit and from the First Nations people in the Yukon uh, and their link to the created order itself. And I see dialogue between people, dialogue, dialogue, dialogue needs to move on. And secondly, perhaps the dialogue with the environments such that we can bring that great wisdom that the Inuit and the Aboriginals, I believe, and that this is not saying hairy fairy kind of, everyone is a saint in, of, among First Nations and Inuit. It is that there's a huge heritage and history that was destroyed, not fully, not, or damaged very badly. And I think there's a lack in including in the dialogue the wonderful created order that speaks to us of our dialogue itself. Thank you very much. The answer to your question is yes. Um, and I'll arrange to leave a paper with the organizers. So a paper will be available. I don't know how they're going to distribute it or what they're going to do with it, but they'll have a copy of the paper. Okay. Hello, and thank you. Thanks very much for what you've said today. It's my understanding that the Canadian Museum of Human Rights has not accepted the idea that genocide has been imposed on the Aboriginal population of this country. My first question is, is it your hope that that position will change? And my second question is, what would you like seen to be taught on that question in the public school system? Well, I think the, uh, there's inevitably going to be a discussion about um, the issue of genocide and Aboriginal people. <clears throat> I think putting residential schools in the conversation of genocide without looking at the overall treatment of Aboriginal people in North America is a foolish thing to do because you can't isolate singular incidents and say that's genocide. I think you have to look at the overall treatment of Aboriginal people and come to a conclusion. And there's a lot of evidence that one could point to that genocide was a motivating factor in much of the approach by 
European colonizers, particularly when you look at the treatment of Aboriginal people by Columbus and his, uh, his uh, army of uh, sailors and soldiers who arrived in, in the uh, latter part of the 15th century, and the, the tremendous number of indigenous people who were massacred during that period following the arrival of Columbus, and then the various other acts of massacre, physical massacre, where people were killed um, by uh, other authorities uh, over the period of time. If you look only at, at Canada's treatment, there's an argument to be made as to whether, in fact, genocide uh, occurred. You can look at the residential school system, and the residential school system clearly falls within one of the categories of genocide passed by the United Nations Convention that uh, has not yet been ruled upon. But the reality is that um, I think you need to look at the overall treatment of, of uh, indigenous people in all of North America to determine the question of whether indigenous people have been the victims of genocide at the hands of white European nations coming to this country since first contact in order to come to a proper conclusion about that. And to that, I think it's probably rather simpler, easier, if I can use that word, to conclude that there, there's very clear evidence that genocide was behind many of these things uh, without having to adjudicate upon the question. Uh, so I think the, the answer is, um, I think that more and more that we investigate this and, and talk about this history, I think the ability for us to come to a clear resolution around the question is going to, is going to become apparent. But I hesitate to look only at one incident or one aspect of history in isolation from all of the others, because I think you need to, you need to look at everything. You can look at Sir John A. Macdonald's decision, for example, to starve the Indians in the prairies in order to get them to sign the treaties, and whether that was an act of genocide. Um, so I, if you put all of that together, the weight of the evidence seems to say that there was a very genocidal approach. And the fact that, in fact, the government uh, made a very clear statement that our intention is to do away with the race of people known as Indians and in incorporate them into Canadian society. Um, the, uh, the author of the Genocide Convention, uh, in his early writings, very clearly said that the treatment of North American indigenous people was an act of cultural genocide. And there's no distinction to be made between cultural genocide and actual genocide. It's genocide. And so, um, so that's, uh, that statement is there as support for all of this. And so in answer to your question, I think that uh, as the conversation goes along, I think we'll be able to come to a, an easy resolution of all of this. But we need to have a conversation about it. Okay, yes, who's over, sorry. Hi, um, I was just um, wondering about uh, the languages that have been lost through the residential schools of, of grandparents and parents. And I was just wondering about the school system, about how we can learn to get our language back. And if, there's, if the, the, the children, uh, the next generation will be receiving that language without being lost. Because beyond me, my language is already lost. I remember, my grandparents did not teach us. So I'm just kind of hoping maybe our own children will be able to learn our own language. My view on, I'm sorry, my view on that is uh, that uh, Aboriginal people who want their children to learn the language shouldn't wait for government to do it for you. I think you need to find a way to get that language for, into the lives of your children. Um, when we were parents and had parents of young children, we ensured that um, we connected our children and children of other parents to uh, grandmothers who had the language and brought those grandmothers together with our children every day for as much as possible. Because the only way you pick up a language at that age is through immersion. And so that needs to be done. So it's really for the parents to ensure that their children get the language as early as possible, and not to say the schools have to do it or the government has to do it. It's for the, the parents to do that as, as in any way that you can. So any language speaker that you can find, bring them into the lives of your children. 
But it's hard to, it's hard to learn uh, or understand when to get that language taught because you don't know it yourself. There's lots of reasons why you can't do it. I know that. I'm not arguing with you. I'm just saying, find a way to do it. It's your child. Miigwech, uh, Justice Sinclair. Um, I was wondering if part of your report might include the fact that even though this residential school situation in North America was 150 years old, say, it's actually from a deliberate and much longer tradition, Eurocentric tradition, that impacted other continents as well and actually still goes on. I do immigration and refugee work, some part of what I do, and I'm finding there are still residential schools in Africa, for instance, and to me the infuriating part is, and the strengthening part of my understanding, is to know that it, the First Nations people in Canada have suffered and are, have a commonality of suffering with indigenous people all around the world? Um, I don't know enough about the uh, residential school system in all of the parts of the world. I know I've studied the, the uh, residential school systems in, uh, in, in British colonies, in um, Australia, New Zealand, and um, Canada, as well as the boarding school system in the United States and to a certain extent the boarding school system in England as well. Uh, so using that as an experience, I've come to two conclusions. One is that um, there's nothing inherently wrong with boarding schools. Sending children to a private boarding school or to a boarding school often meets the needs of the community because not every community in this jurisdiction is going to be able to have a high school or have a school that provides a full service education uh, load for all of its children. And so uh, Aboriginal communities in northern Manitoba have to consider sending their children to some kind of a residential school system or some kind of a residence in order that they can attend a school system where they can receive a public education. The difference between the, the, um, the, the Indian residential school system and the American Indian boarding school system and what occurred in Australia and uh, creating a boarding school system like I'm talking about is A, the compulsory nature of it, and B, the abusive nature of it. And uh, so uh, it's just, it's the way that it's managed, the way that it's done, it's the way the children are treated and taken care of. You can have a, 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 an immersion uh, nursery, a nursery school to grade 12 private uh, residential school system for indigenous children in Manitoba, where they're taught a complete education load, totally in the language of their ancestors. And I think that's probably an option that many young parents would find attractive if there could be a way to create such a school. Because you can't find a school in this jurisdiction that educates in that way. Sorry, if I, if I may, I was referring to the abusive ones the famous movie, for instance, from Australia, talking about the rabbit fence. Rabbit proof fence, yeah. Yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Ani, Justice uh, Murray Sinclair, I'm over here. Oh, there you are, okay. Ani, um, I have actually, an, I have an observation and a question. Um, I studied Canadian Aboriginal history in university, so I learned all about the IRS and um, that's when I learned about my culture. And I guess my observation was, as the children were being taken away at five years old, um, they were being taught to take the Indian out of them. So now my question is, now that we're on this path to healing, what do you think is the appropriate age to start educating Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal children about the RRS? because the reason why I asked this is, is because I noticed when Aboriginal children are taken away, it was such a young age. So now, you know, in the 21st century, how do we educate society about this? And what do you think is the earliest age that we could teach each about this? And I apologize, I sound like I'm echoing. 
Well, um, in a perfect system, children shouldn't be taught about the history of residential schools until they're 15 or 16 years of age. But I think it's hard for them to understand the, the nature of the abuse that went on until they're mature enough to deal with it. Um, and I think in the early years, I think children really should be taught about how to get along with each other, how to respect each other, how to uh, understand one another and treat each other better. And I think that should be the focus of all educational programs until you get them to the point where you start to give them information about the world around them. And, you know, I, I remember listening to elders talking about how children historically and traditionally were educated. And for the first period of their life, they were left with the mothers and the aunties and, and the uh, grandmothers in order to be taught how to behave and how to t be respectful and how to deal with uh, the common problems that children have and how to, uh, d to cope with those things and uh, to understand that everything that occurs, they'll always have someone who will love them and take care of them. And then at a, at a, at a certain age, then the fathers, the uncles, the older brothers, the men of the community are brought in to educate them about the things that they bring to the relationship and how to do those things and the importance of that. And then at a, another point in time, then they're taught how to be the warriors and how to, how to understand relationships with all other people of the world. But you're not loading them all with this stuff all at, at a very tender age. So I think ideally, the early years should always be focused upon just teaching them how to like each other and to be respectful and to be considerate and to, uh, to take that forward in their lives. I think the problem we have is that the educational system is separated from the family too much. And so as a result, what they receive at school is sometimes not consistent with what they're receiving at home and vice versa. And so it, um, that, that becomes the challenge of how to incorporate the family into the school so that it's all done in a cohesive manner for the children. But to get back to your question about well, how old should children be, be before they're allowed to listen to statements like this, I think when they're old enough to handle it, and I don't think that would be until they're much older in life. But some of the information about the history of this country and how this country dealt with things should be done in a way that's not damaging to that early relationship that they form with each other. So it's not an us and them question. It's about this is what this country has come through. So. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Justice Sinclair, for... Yeah, apparently, you're the last question. Okay. Thank you, Justice Sinclair, so for make having... It good, make it a good one. <laughs> Thank you, Justice Sinclair, for having to deal with the insurmountable task of dealing with the perpetrator of a crime to try to actually do it in a right, properly funded, properly taken care of way, and that the victims of the crime, like we're, we've, we've, I guess we've been educated so much because they've been always trying to push police on us and all this other things that the victims of crime, we're here for the victims of crime. Well, we haven't been here for the victims of crime. And, and the numbers you were telling us about the amounts of money that, you know, is being paid out, but it's not a lot because when you think about it, there's a large amount of victims of crime here. And they're actually, it's the perpetrator seems to be getting away with not actually helping them heal properly by providing the proper services and the proper, like, understandings. Like, I'm, I met this one guy who's a successful musician and we were talking and he's in a drum group and then he was he started crying he was telling me about his parents and their residential school survivors but he said they're screwed up they're they're so hurt and he can't do anything for them and and i'm like yeah we're not doing anything for the victims of crime and i just went on that march with the with about the girl who got killed who was murdered in the in the river and then dumped in the river and uh and, and people there were telling me about CFS and how that's working to, to hurt the mothers almost. It's like you destroy the mothers, you destroy the people, and then you have no treaty obligations ever again. I'm sure you're going to lead into a question any moment now. That's, that's what I'm saying is that 
are they living up? Is there a way to force us, the perpetrators of the crimes, to, to actually provide the real services to make sure that the victims of crime are taken care of? How do we do that? That's a huge question. It is a good one, though. Um, and I'm not, without knowing more, I suppose, it's hard for me to respond to it, so I'm not quite sure how to respond to it. I can tell you that the, um, the nature of uh, victimization that's been going on for the Aboriginal community has a unique flavor to it because it's overlaid with all of this history that I've talked about. And sometimes um, one sense of victimization is magnified by all of this um, history of racism that has gone on in this country for a long period of time. Uh, but when people are the victims of a violent offense, I think that uh, we all have an obligation as a society to ensure that, um, that whatever it is that the individual victim needs in order to be able to, to put that into a proper place for themselves and be able to move on as undamaged as possible is done for them. And that the perpetrators are, are dealt with in a manner that's appropriate to the relationship that they're having that they want to have with each other. So dealing with an offender uh, in an assault case, for example, uh, may depend upon whether they're strangers or whether they're husband and wife who want to continue to have a relationship together. Uh, because sometimes you can put a penalty in place that will cause more damage, not just to the relationship, but more harm to the victim as well and the family uh, of the victim. So I don't have a, a direct answer to your question because I think everything is contextual. It needs to be looked at in the context of, of uh, what's been going on. But I do know that um, <clears throat> I'm, a, I'm a strong believer in restorative justice and restorative justice approach. And when uh, individuals are coming from a place of, of, uh, of uh, victimization in their own past and they then perpetrate an offense on somebody else, if you want to stop them from continuing to be offenders, you have to help them deal with their own victimization as well. And that's a, that's a serious issue that the criminal justice system is just having, has a lot of trouble with. And I, um, I, you know, I acknowledge that um, not everybody agrees with what I've been saying. And in fact, it's interesting you mentioned the amount of money that's been paid to the uh, victims of the residential school abuse. And, uh, and one time in, in a, a moment of immense stupidity, which I managed to make other people look like an act of courage, I went on a, a call-in show in Alberta to uh, talk about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And, and of course, the majority of questions that came through to me in, on that show were that this was an immense amount of money that's being spent on all these people who don't know how to handle it. And why would we continue to give these people these huge sums of money? Uh, because it just doesn't make sense. <clears throat> and my, my answer to the first question, I think, was uh, a able to keep the other questions from becoming worse than the first question was. And my, my, my answer is, well, if your daughter had gone to a school and had been sexually assaulted over a period of three years by a man on 22 different occasions, how much money do you think she should be entitled to be paid for that kind of an assault? And of course the answer is no amount of money will ever pay for that, and I said precisely. Because um, the victimization is just um, irre irremediable. It's like you can't, you can't do enough to help somebody to deal with that kind of an offense, or that kind of victimization. So. As I said, I'm sorry I don't have an answer really for your question, but it's a good conversation to have. Okay. Thank you all again, and I appreciate being here with you. Megawitch, I now call upon Ms. Marianne Clark, a master's student in the Joint Master's Program in Peace and Conflict Studies and Ms. Jennifer Hamm, a recent graduate of the program, to express our appreciation. Thank you. Um, 
On behalf of the Morrow Center, I would just like to extend our gratitude to Justice Murray Sinclair for being here today. Uh, we do have a small gift uh, to give you for our appreciation as well. It's such an honor to be able to thank Judge Sinclair. I've actually been wanting to thank him for over 30 years for the work that he does for all of us. Back when he was just Murray, it started, and he's shown us so many teachings that it, it's beyond my, my, my words. Um, he, the biggest thing about, um, th that I can say about um, Judge Murray Sinclair is um, that he is a true human being. And by that, I mean that he, um, he's a whole person, and he is available to all kinds of people at all times. He's never, he never turns his back on anybody. And uh, I hope and pray that today we take the teachings that he's given us. And for me, the best way to honor that is to reflect on them and to try to put them into action. So words can't express it, but I'd like to say thank you to you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Marianne and Jen. Uh, to mark the occasion, the Board of Directors of the Arthur V. Morrow Center has decided to create a graduate fellowship in his name to be known as the Justice Murray Sinclair Graduate Fellowship in Peace and Justice. I would like to thank all of those who helped to prepare today's event, especially Jason Brennan, Annette Jones, and Bonnie Warkentine. Um, just briefly, some upcoming center events. Um, if you check the Morrow Center's website, www.umanitoba.ca slash Morrow underscore center uh, for a list of, of our events. Um, but in uh, March 24, 2015, Dr. Celia Kukoffman, uh, who is the Burkholder Professor of Conflict Resolution, will be here to give a lecture on gender and peace building and May 13th to the 16th is the 10th Winnipeg International Storytelling Festival. Um, thank you for coming uh, to this memorable event and please have a safe trip home. Thank you very much. <laughs>